Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first episode of the Facing Hypocrisy podcast. Well, let me tell you how this thing got started, okay? The first step in solving any problem is recognizing that there is one. And on the last episode of the Mixing and Chilling Vogue, Kenny had us watch a clip from a HBO series called The Newsroom. And in this clip, there was a college grad that asked the panel, what makes America the greatest country in the world? And in that video, we found out that, well, America isn't the greatest country in the world. In his speech, he said 207 sovereign states in the world, 180 of them, at least 180 of them have freedom. Hold on a minute. This is exactly what's wrong with this world today. Everyone assumes that since it's on TV, well, it's got to be true. Since it's on YouTube, it's got to be true. How many of you out there know someone who truly believes that, well, since it's on the internet, it's got to be true? Or how about the people who think that, well, if I Google it and I get a big search result, well, everybody agrees with it, so it's got to be true. How about Facebook or Twitter? Or how about, like, health institutions? I don't know, like the Cleveland Clinic, or perhaps the institution formerly known as John Hopkins School of Public Health, which, by the way, started out with a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation and was the second school of public health in the United States after Tulane University. But I bet you didn't even know about Tulane University. Or that Rockefeller gave the funds that started John Hopkins School of Public Health. Well, I'm here to tell you folks, 207 states, that's false. Let alone 207 sovereign states. There's only 206 listed states. And of those, sovereignty is supposedly undisputed in 188 states, of which 187 are UN member states. And as for Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, well, that went into the history books in 2001 when failed presidential candidate and ex-New York mayor, billionaire Michael Bloomberg, donated $2.9 billion to create the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. All right, all right, all right. Actually, he wasn't a failed presidential candidate until March 4th of 2020. Matter of fact, he wasn't even mayor of New York until he switched from being a lifelong Democrat to a Republican and then won the election on November 6th of 2001. But I don't wanna digress. We're talking about how America isn't the greatest country in the world in his little speech that he gave where he said, America is seventh in literacy. Actually, that's false. We're ranked 51, according to wisevoter.com. I don't know why the Washington Post wants you to think that America is only seventh in literacy. 27th in math is false. Let's go learn.com has us ranked 32nd in math. And 22nd in science and 49th in life in expectancy and 178th in infant mortality are all wrong. They're not current numbers. Some of them are worse. Some of them got a little better. But I bet you didn't know that everything that you've been hearing so far and saw in that speech was wrong. So whose fault is it that all these things are inaccurate and that you don't know the truth. Nor do you know where you can go and get reliable information that is true, accurate, and up to date. Are you to blame? Are the politicians? Are social media platforms? Or does it belong to the no longer independent press who's constantly pushing their corporate interest-driven, fear-mongering stories 
to drive ad revenue from big pharma interest who are counting on you to get just sick enough yet you have to take another one of their pills for the rest of your life instead of oh i don't know maybe the press informing you so you can realize that it's the constant fast food and processed foods that are laced with high fructose corn syrup and dextrose and sugar and red dye number five or more salt than an average American under the age of 50 is supposed to consume in an entire day. Let alone the fact that if you're over 50 like me, well, that daily salt intake drops from 2,300 milligrams a day to 1,500 milligrams a day. Meanwhile, you were just thinking about going out to Arby's and picking up six mozzarella sticks, right? Well, those six mozzarella sticks has over 2,500 milligrams of sodium without any sauce to dip them in. <sighs> Honestly, folks, I think the blame lies on all of us, all of the above. But it wasn't always like this. When I was growing up, and like most of you, I'd be willing to bet, we had paper routes delivered the paper because people wanted to be informed about what was going on. We look forward to reading what the press had to say because they held people accountable. They held government accountable for when they did something wrong. And overall, they looked out for the public interest. It's not like that anymore. Whatever happened to waging wars on poverty instead of the poor? Whatever happened to sacrifice for the greater good, caring about our neighbors, and just all around making the world a better place for our children than what we had growing up? We'll certainly not find those kind of things in the press anymore. And whatever happened to the public caring about what's actually happening? People nowadays, they take the deceit, hook, line, and sinker. They know that it's all mistruths and exaggerations or outright lies, but they simply don't care. Well, folks, I'm here to change that because I'm tired of seeing everyone feel controlled, manipulated, and powerless. Knowledge is power, and with power comes great responsibility to do good. So, it's time for us to face the hypocrisy and to demand change when we find they're doing the wrong thing. And that can only happen if we get caught up on what's going on around us. So it's time for a little bit of news. Right, folks first things first we got to start with a little bit of advocacy because obviously um when the government's trying to impose higher taxes on people it's time to get the word out it's time for all of us out there to get a hold of our representatives and go hey man what you're doing is wrong we don't want more taxes especially when those taxes are disproportionately going to cause more harm than they could ever possibly do good if the government collected it and used it for some other purpose. So first off, 
If you aren't a member of CASA, I need you to go to their website, C-A-S-A-A dot O-R-G, and sign up to become a member. And they will keep you informed on what's going on around you every single day. Like how we've currently got a new tax that's going into place. And this is not just a vapor tax. This is also a tobacco tax. It's how they're grouping, grouping and lumping all of this together, right? So they want to double the tax that's being collected on any form of tobacco out there. And they want to have parity with tobacco taxes across all spectrums, even though they have no idea how we consume these products. Not a clue. Because the tax, if you use this device, is completely different than a tax that you would pay if you use this type of a device. And it's completely different if it's a device like this one. Guess who's going to per profit from all of this? It's easy to figure out. Big Tobacco and Big Pharma because People, when they go into the store and they want to pick up something that used to cost them $30 that they were our, our irate about having to pay $30 for something that they know deep down inside costs less than five bucks to make. And that more than half of what they were paying for it is already taxed. Well, that's not going to go up again. You're going to pay 50 or $60 for a bottle because a bottle lasts you a week. So they want you to pay the same tax as an entire carton of cigarettes. Whatever. We'll get to that too. There's so much knowledge that I have learned over the past four years, and that's the purpose of this podcast, is to convey some of this knowledge to you so that when you see these scaremongering stories and you see this type of thing and you look at these certain people that are supposed to be in charge of public health and everything they do is the opposite of what public health needs, it's easier to understand why they are the way they are. I mean, it's easy for us to just blow it off and say, okay, well, they're just crooked, right? They're, they're in the pockets of big farmer or they're in the pockets of big tobacco or... <sighs> Realistically, most people are out there to try and make the world a better place. They might be misguided in how they're doing it. They might be misinformed. They might have tunnel vision. And if you ever actually had a conversation with somebody and you wanted to convince them of it, well, if you don't understand the way that they think and what is behind, what's their motivation for doing things the way that they do them, there's no hope for you to ever convince them that what they're doing is wrong because you're gonna be convincing them of something that, well, they already agree with you, but they're not gonna tell you that they agree with you because they're, ulterior motives that they have going on in the ulterior, and it's not even a motive, it's as much as there's a priority, makes a lot more sense if you know the person and know parts of their history that have been long forgotten about because well, nobody wants to talk about it because they think it's irrelevant, but it really isn't. Perfect example of this is Dr. Brian King, right? I posted something on Twitter because if you go to his alumni page, you'll come to find out, you know, as most alumni pages do, they like to brag about their graduates and the success that they've had and how it's all attributed to going to that university. It's all marketing. But you want to learn about somebody, you got to go dig in places that most people don't look to dig. And that just happens to be one of them. And we'll cover that later on, too. I'm going to try and stay focused on the news here because this is going to end up being a really long recording and nobody's going to want to watch it. And we're already 15 minutes into it and um, just getting to the advocacy. I'd like to take, you know, a good 10 or 15 minutes for us to dig into why this has come about. What's motivating this, right? I'll give you two guesses and I guarantee you'll be able to get them. Who is pushing for this in the House and who's pushing for this in the Senate? All right. Very simple. Same names we always hear about. Roger Christian Amorphy and Senator Dick Durbin. Let's take a look at this. If you take a look, you'll see 
Oh, we also have a co-sponsor, Debbie Washerman Schultz. Oh, yeah. Another ugly representative in government. But here's the wording. This is what it's all based on. And if you take a look at the text, just real quick, we're not going to go and actually read this whole thing. But it's, it's getting in there and it's literally trying to put a same dollar amount on everything that's out there. Smoke, smokeless tobacco products, you know, the least harmful product that's out there, the one that's also the most like pharmaceutical products. It's going from $1.51 to $26.86 because that makes it equal to combustible cigarettes, you see, which is a load of horse shit. And 50 cents is now going to be $10.74. Do you see what they're doing here? They're taking all the safer forms of nicotine consumption and making them extraordinarily expensive. There goes any possible hope of convincing a smoker, hey man, switch to this. It is much cheaper way for you to be able to, you know, not die. Is that what their goal is? Is is that is their goal to make sure that, you know, anybody that decides that they want a cigarette or they want to, you know, smoke some cannabis ends up just dying earlier so they don't have to pay their Social Security and Medicare because they'll never reach the age to actually collect it? Is that what their goal is? Nah. Small cigarettes are going from $50.33 to $100.66. Yeah, large cigarettes are going from $105 to $211, literally doubling the taxes. So here we have, over the course of the last couple of decades, we've had people quitting smoking. Some people transition to being a vapor, and some people completely give up the habit altogether. Well, unless you're one of the people that completely gave up the habit altogether, get back, get ready to um, hand over the government your money once again, because now they're going to make vaping just as expensive as smoking. Yeah. And who's the, who do we have to thank for all of this? No, I'm not donating you any money. You dirty, rotten, I can't say the words right now. Dick Durbin, this guy has been in office longer, well, maybe not longer than I've been alive, but pretty damn close to it. <sighs> you wanna know how you know? It's actually really simple. Dick Durbin has a net worth of $2 million. Yeah. Do you have a net worth of $2 million when you get to be his age? And how about the fact that the mean net worth of all the senators, this is 2016, so it's actually gonna be much higher than that by now, unless you know the trend reversed for some mysterious reason. The median net worth in the Senate is $3.23 million. And in 2016, his net worth was 1.94, so I'm sure it's well over $2 million now. This isn't the first time he's meddled in things. Dick Durbin slams FDA's legal free fall on tobacco regulation that jeopardizes public health. What? Durbin slams FDA legal free fall on tobacco regulation. FDA has halted its own decision to remove Juul. Well, yeah, because they knew they were going to get sued. And what good does it do? to just throw the denial out there when they know that they are unjustly doing that and there are legal precedent and reasons, scientific reasons, why their jewel is appropriate for the protection of public health and they know that it's gonna be tied up in court and nothing's actually going to get accomplished. So rather than grandstanding and, oh, look, we're just gonna deny it like we've denied 99.99% .99 of everything else, well, here you've got a multi-billion dollar company that they know is going to fight this tooth and nail. They're not just gonna allow the FDA to remove their products off the market. Well, 
This ain't the first time he's gotten involved in that. And he doesn't know what's going on. And fortunately, we do have people fighting back. I love how Windows and Word are trying to protect our security and keep us from opening things. Are you sure you really want to open it? Well, did somebody else click on it or was it me pushing a mouse button? Anyway, AVM urges investigation of Dick Durbin. American uh, Vapor Manufacturers Association has requested that the Senate Ethics Committee investigate Illinois Senator Dick Durbin. Notice both Raja and Durbin are from Illinois. I don't know what's in the water over there. I'm sorry, Mallory Gates, but there's something in the water in Illinois because both of these schmucks are there pounding the pavement trying to eliminate safer forms of nicotine. Uh, are they in the pocket interest of Big Pharma and um, Big Tobacco? No, because Juul was considered Big Tobacco, so there's got to be a deeper reason behind this, right? What is it? What are the deeper reasons behind this? But he was he was trying to push the FDA through the force of you know letters like this and visits and conversations, you know. That's not how the government's supposed to work. See, the government, you've got the executive branch and you've got Congress, which is the House and the Senate, and then you've got the judicial branch and Congress passes the laws. Congress is not the Justice Department. Senator Dick Durbin has no business whatsoever telling the FDA to go do something. That's the job of the Justice Department. If the Justice Department says, hey man, there's a law in the books, it's my job to enforce it, they're not enforcing it, I need to go have a conversation with them. It's not a senator's job to do the job of the Justice Department. We're gonna argue about things, let's keep them in context and let's actually make the valid claims that need to be made. And this is, like I said, this isn't the first time that he's done this kind of stuff. Durbin to FDA, follow the law, pull unauthorized e-cigarettes from the market immediately to protect America's children. Let me ask you a question. Do you honestly think that the FDA has got the manpower and the resources to actually go and visit the, I don't know, five, 10,000 vape shops we have in this country? Every single one of them to find out if they're compliant with the law? And even if they did, what about all the gas stations and convenience stores and bars and restaurants and all the other places that, well, they're not following the law ever. They never did. You walk into a gas station out in the middle of East Boom Boom, up north, down south, any rural area, take your pick, and you can go and readily get products like this. They have them right there, right next to the cigarettes, behind the counter, locked up in cases. They're not tobacco shops. I mean, the gas stations are because they sell cigarettes, but a lot of places, the rural areas, when they passed the vape mail ban, that was the worst thing they could have ever done. Did it actually protect the kids? No. It just forced adults to get it from the same black market suppliers that were supplying it to the kids. Unintended consequences of legislative action. A decade-long delay in the Food and Drug Administration to properly regulate electronic cigarettes is in a league of its own. Now, you know what's in a league of its own? Is how many of these elderly geriatric representatives do we have in government? That's what I think we need to have a conversation about. How is it that they haven't retired? They have no desire to retire. It's about power and greed. They want to say that the FDA is not doing their job. How about Congress isn't doing their job? Which, by the way, wants this to go through. And who's on the side of this going through? Well, no one other than Dr. Brian King. Because see, Dr. Brian King, I was, I was gonna talk about this later, but 
I need to clear the air about this. All right. Give me one second. All right. Finally found it. It's buried. I've got so many links for this episode of the of the podcast. I want you to get to know Dr. Brian King, right? University of Buffalo alumni, Department of Epidemiology and Environmental Health, and they um, have this partnership with another university that we all know as the Roswell Park Cancer Center. And this isn't a unique thing. When I was going through and getting my bachelor's degree, I was actually going to community college who has a partnership with Franklin University in Ohio and was able to do my stuff online and um, anything I had to do in person was done at the community college. Well, this is the same kind of situation that they have going on with um, University of Buffalo and Roswell Park Cancer Center, okay? Long story short, you take a look at it here, you will clearly find out that Dr. Brian King, his original plan was to attend medical school. He changed course during his junior year of undergraduate study, right? When he was working in the inpatient pharmacy of a local hospital. And then he realized he had a, a blinking idea moment a grand gesture where he realized that prevention is the solution. Why are we just constantly just treating the sick people, treating the sick people? He says it's not just treatment that's crucial for combating adverse health outcomes. At a population level, the only actually effective method to change the population level health outcome is through prevention alone. This prompted him to pursue his MPH, Master of Public Health in Epidemiology. And it was during that time that he became passionate about helping to build evidence-based support, public health policy and practice, particularly in regard to tobacco control. Yeah. Because his idea is prevention. If we just stop everybody from having it, well, That'll fix the problem. He, could, he looks at it from a long-term perspective and goes, these people that are smoking, they're gonna die anyway. They can go and use the regular pharmaceutical routes. And when they get sick, statistics show that, you know, people quit smoking. So we just let them get sick. And then we let big pharma make the money off of them because they're sick. But we all know, just cause you get COPD doesn't mean you stop smoking. Just because you get high blood pressure, heart attack, peripheral vascular disease, just because you have a stroke, doesn't mean that everybody's gonna quit smoking. That's not how it works. He doesn't understand the fundamental characteristic and the fundamental aspect that when we smoked, we enjoyed it. It wasn't just the nicotine. We didn't do it for some kind of buzz like the kids do when they binge drink. It wasn't about you know altering our mental state. We enjoy it. We enjoyed the ritualistic aspect of it, that it was our stress relief. It forced us to stop what we were doing, go and smoke outside. When they're banning the smoking indoors thing, they're not making the smoking situation any different. If anything, they're making smokers' lives better because, well, we have to take a break. We have to stop working. We have to go to a designated smoking area. That was the greatest break in the whole day. For a smoker, it's better than lunch. Better than a lunch break because, well, during a lunch break, you can smoke anyway, but why waste your time eating when you can just sit there and smoke? People that you know study this stuff have no clue. If they've never done it, they really have no clue. They keep forgetting to talk to the actual people that they're studying. Be surprised how many studies are out there that are completely unrealistic. And if they would have simply talked to one of the study participants to get some input on, well, what the study's doing and how they're doing it, half the studies would either not be done because it's the dumbest thing in the world and you're not gonna be able to accomplish anything, or would have to be altered to actually be a realistic outcome based upon what actually goes on. I keep digressing, 
Because there's so much information that you need to learn and know about before you just make judgments on certain things that are out there. Like how this is how he chose to implement his prevention team, get the science out there to guide the policy making. And well, then you're going to get the prevention on a mass scale on public health. He's trying to save everybody's lives. Forget about the fact that he's trying to save everybody's lives generations down the road and there's gonna be millions and millions of people dying. They, they haven't changed the figure. 480,000 Americans die every single year from smoking cigarettes. They haven't changed that in how long? It's the same figure. Well, there's less people smoking now than there was before and I know it takes you know decades for the effects of people stopping smoking to improve their health outcome and reduce the disease potential actually seen in hospitals, but you can map it out. Why is it the exact same number? That doesn't make any sense to me, especially because vaping's been on the scene now for over two decades. And the number of smokers have died and plummeted and because of it, another conversation. Anyway, here's what you need to know. The tobacco control vaccine, written at the CDC by Dr. Brian King and Corian Gufunder. Goofunder, what a name. Vaccines serve a critical role in the prevention and control of communicable diseases. Vaccines have prevented countless cases and saved millions of lives globally, blah, 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 polio, smallpox, measles, diphtheria, influenza, multiple others. But he wants to create the tobacco control vaccine. And what is a tobacco control vaccine? Well, we have to have Tobacco price increases. You wanna know why Dick Durbin and Roger and Christian Morphy are doing this? Well, they had a conversation with the FDA and said, FDA, you need to you need to ban all these things. You need to go out there and enforce the law and you know get these people to stop selling these um, e-cigarettes and stuff. Listen, that's not gonna work. All you're gonna do is create a thriving, flourishing black market and it's gonna go deep underground. Nobody's gonna know who's selling it. At least right now, we have a general idea where people are going to get it and they're getting a regulated safe supply. So, well, what can we do then? What can we do? Well, you can double the prices on tobacco. We already did that. Do it again. There you go. Tobacco price increases. You want to know why they're coming along the lines? There's your answer. Right from Dr. Brian King's pen himself. Smoke-free policies. Ban it everywhere you can. Ban it. Just ban it. Only let them go to their little corner, we'll regulate them into the closet, and they can go smoke in the closet. We don't, ever want, we don't want anybody to see it or hear about it. Well, we know that they're gonna smell them when they come out of their closet smoking, because we all smelled that stuff, and, but except when we were smoking, we didn't realize that we smelled that bad. Anyway, cessation access. Well, well that, that, that would mean that they should promote vaping, right? Because it's a well-documented, less harmful product, right? Well, no, he works at the FDA. What's the FDA take care of? Not the public health. They're, they're big financial donors are big pharma. So when big pharma puts out patches and gums and sprays, well, that's okay. That can be in the bottom shelf of any grocery store, over the counter, we proved the safety of nicotine a long time ago. But, well, if it's in a vape, oh my God, got to lock that away and ban it. So they can keep collecting their tobacco taxes. Is that what it's all about? And you want to know why they have some ridiculous campaigns about maggots in the brain and all this other stuff, right? Well, that's based on science, hard hitting media campaigns. It's not about truth. Nobody said that the media campaigns had to be truthful. They just had to scare the shit out of people. And the only people that it infuriates are the actual smokers who didn't pay any attention to it and chose to quit smoking. We get pissed off by it because had they had told us the truth a long time ago, we would have quit a long time ago. What more science do these people need to realize that their tobacco control tactics are complete and utter rubbish and failure? 
when the price went up on a pack of cigarettes, did it stop you from smoking as much as you did? No. You might have switched to a cheaper brands, you know, GPCs, Grandma Personal Choice Cigarettes, the ones that are plain packaging from the start because the cheap cigarettes are so cheap that they're not wasting the money on ink on the cigarettes. As long as it says GPC on it and the mandated government warning, that's all the marketing they ever gone. And you saved a couple bucks because, well, they weren't marketed. They were the cheapest cigarettes you could buy at state minimum prices. Who cares they tasted like crap? Who cares that most of it was just stems and not actual tobacco leaves? When you're a smoker, those things didn't matter. Price went up, you just paid it. And there were plenty of people out there that gave up meals so they could go buy their pack of cigarettes. How is that good for the public health? When you have somebody that is using this product, you can call them addicted to it if it makes you feel better about yourself, all right? But how does it feel better knowing that your laws that you pass and your taxes that you pass are actually causing them to go without meals or not buy their kids a toy for a holiday or as many toys as they could if dad didn't have to pay $6 in taxes for every pack of cigarettes he bought, that your tax increases didn't stop him from buying. You wanna talk about disparities and health disparities? How about the cause of certain poverty in this country is because of sin taxes? No, the tobacco control is never gonna take a look at that perspective of it. They're not gonna look at the suffering that they create in their fortitude to eliminate tobacco of any shape or size, but here you go. Sizably increase the price of tobacco products is the single most effective intervention at reducing consumption, particularly among price sensitive populations such as the youth and the poor, who by the way are disproportionately higher percentage of smokers than the rich segments of society. So we're gonna make the poor's life even worse because well, it is prevention. It's gonna stop you from buying cigarettes. Forget about the fact that, you know, the money they actually collect from cigarette taxes don't actually go to treat cigarette problems. 0.04% or something is what they've spent from the master settlement agreement in actual cessation promotion. If they actually took every, every dollar that they made in tobacco taxes and used it for cessation, like the UK is handing out vapes to smokers, the program would be over with and it would end. Because, well, if you get people to switch to a safer product, well, the only thing, good, only thing that's gonna come out of that is good. Good for the public health. Unless you were, you know, one of those rare idiots out there that think that it's good to have a massive healthcare system that is overrun and charging astronomical amounts of money because they're treating people that are poor who get sick from all the smoking that they did. I mean, you want to improve society or don't you? You're not going to improve society by doing the same damn thing we've been doing for decades. It's time for a change. It's time for something different. Smoke-free policies. Well, we just talked about that. Just off the cuff, I told you. The smoke-free policies as a smoker, well, it actually made my life better because I had to go outside and take a break and I had to go into a butt hut to smoke. Did it stop me from smoking? No, I didn't care one bit. Hard hitting media campaigns. Mass reach health communication interventions are scientifically proven for prevention of initiation of tobacco among youth. No, it's not. No, it's not. We can go and have a nice long armored conversation about the fact that these marketing campaigns only create and foster curiosity in the use. Why are they making such a big fuss about all this stuff? I hear that this is a much safer thing than smoking cigarettes. Our whole life we've been told about how bad combustion is, how bad smoking is. But my friends are doing this and 
I'm not coughing. What? Are we crazy? Do they? Do these people not actually look at reality when they create these media campaigns? And well, they're only targeted. They're only targeted for the youth. But the adults are supposed to be watching their kids, right? So when the adults are watching the kids, they see the same messaging campaigns. You wonder why 90% of the people think that nicotine is a harmful substance and needs to be banned off the face of the earth? Despite all the health effects and the positive health ramifications of using nicotine? That's another conversation we'll get to one day. These hard-hitting media campaigns, you're literally killing people by putting this misinformation out there. And then we finally get to cessation access. Oh, yes. You would think that, well, these things would be readily available everywhere because that's the best scientifically proven cessation method for the smoker, for the tobacco user out there, right? Despite the fact that they're an environmental piece of crap, because it's disposable, it's technically a single use product. You buy it, it's manufactured, it's sold, it's used, and when it's empty and it goes bad, it gets thrown in the trash. This is horrible. Except for the fact that anybody could buy this instead of buying a pack of cigarettes. And they may never buy another pack of cigarettes again because they bought this. Yeah, this would be much better for the environment. But you got to learn about ohms and resistance and voltage and coils and cotton and liquid. And there's too many choices. There's a reason why a lot of the restaurants you go to has a one page menu. Here's breakfast. Here's lunch. That's it. Because when you give people too many options, they get lost in the process and don't know what to do. So for some people, this is God's gift to their health. It's that simple. Anyway, you wanna know more about this? There's gonna be a link to the article in the end. I know we've gone on 43 minutes already and I really haven't talked much about the news. So let's jump into it. Oh, what are we gonna to go to? How about one, one last dig. I'm sorry, I can't help myself. One last dig. Now, go away. New York Times is the most annoying thing in the world. Here are the oldest 20 members of Congress. All right. Let me take this link. Watch this. We'll see if this works. It's been a while since I've done this. See if it works. I doubt it. Of course not. Well, let's take another look at another website because the information isn't unique to the New York Times and their misinformation. House gets younger. Look at the picture that they chose to represent the fact that the house is getting younger. Oh my goodness. What's the average age of our senators and our house lawmakers? How about 57.9 years old? And oh my goodness, that's down from 58.9 years ago and 58 in the 116th and 58.4 in the 100. Why is it that our representatives in government are at least 60 years old? And why is it, oh, the one thing that you got to miss over there is because the Senator Dianne Feinstein, right? She was one of the oldest members in the Senate, in, 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 in government, 90 some years old, right? She died in office. Why, why are these people dying in office? Don't they have grandkids that they want to go spend time with? Why are they so stuck on saying where they're at? There's only one answer, and you know what it is. It's the money. It's all the money they make. Just take a look at all these people and look what generation they're from. 35 members. 
or 40 to 49 or 30 to 39. 117 of them are 60 to 70 years old. 61 of them are 70 to 80 years old. And 11 of them, well now 10, are over 80 years old. Representing us in government. You know what? You've had four decades to get the shit right. Why are these people getting reelected? when they keep just making the situation worse? Is it because the media is misinforming people? Or is it because people are so distracted by what else is going on around them? So let's take a look at some, oh, I don't know, information that had happened this past week and find out, is there any good news out there? I got one more bad piece of information for you. Something else that's coming up in the news you should be well aware of. Thank you for the advertisement. Thank you for the cookie notice. Thank you for another advertising message. FDA sends final menthol rule for review. Whether you like it or not, that's what they've been working on. It's gonna be another year or so, probably before it happens. Maybe it'll happen sooner if they don't meet enough resistance, or maybe it'll get completely banned because the um, Congressional Budget Office might nix the whole idea saying, well, it's just not feasible for us to do this. The cost is gonna be too high for what you actually wanna accomplish. But menthol ban, imagine if all you could get was tobacco flavored tobacco and any less harmful product must taste like tobacco or you're not gonna be allowed to manufacture it. No unflavored even, because you might adulterate it with actual flavors you might enjoy. What is wrong with these tobacco control people? They just don't get it. Well, they're not the only ones that are screwed up. Police department breaks up burglary. <sighs> these this, this pop-ups are legally required now. Let me tell you, if you wanna manage a website, Forget about the overhead that you gotta do now to meet government compliance about having a website out there because EU law now requires privacy practices be taking place and notification be given to the customer that you're actually gonna collect their information. Even when you don't collect their information, but the operating system of the web software that you're using to produce a website, well, it collects data so it can improve itself. Even though none of it is identifiable, none of it is gonna reveal anything about you, to the manufacturer of the software, there still has to be a warning given that there's data being collected by you visiting the website. Really? More proof that what government's doing is not improving the situation. It's only making it worse. All right. Police departments break up burglary ring that targeted smoke and vape shops. Isn't this fantastic? We have in the United States, Tobacco 21, that prevents anybody under the age of 21 from legally purchasing any tobacco product of any kind, right? So what happens when like a lot of our generation started smoking by stealing it from our parents and well, they get to the age of maturity where they're now stuck between 18 and 21. You can't steal from mom and dad anymore because you're not living with them anymore. What are you gonna do? Well, you see it as a market opportunity because well, there are a lot of your friends having the same boat that you're in and you can go and break into a shop and you can get this stuff. It's gonna cost you nothing. You get what you want for your needs and you get to make some money by selling it to your friends. Well, there you go. This is gonna become a more common occurrence. That's a fact of life. And then what's gonna to happen to these people? You wonder why the United States had such a high incarceration rate for the population? This is exactly why. They start in the system as juveniles, and once they get that on their rap sheet, 
the chance of them having a life outside of crime diminishes the longer this stuff goes on. A couple of larceny suspects are now in custody after police say they broke into a smoke and vape shop in August. According to Aberdeen Police Department, officers responded to the area of 1680 NC5 for a business alarm activation. Yeah, long story short, they got caught and now they're in the criminal justice system. Leading vape brand SKE puts the environment first with new products backed by a high profile pioneering public education campaign. Fantastic. For those of you over in London, you'll get to see this actual recycling program put together by SKE. You're going to see bins and receptacles for you to deposit your disposable products. And they aren't the only ones that are doing this. This is now a actual campaign that is taking on actual merit and basis in UK because the uh, manufacturers of these products realize they don't want to give the public a bad name and that it's up to them and their fiduciary duty to be responsible members of society. This is what the right thing is to do. Now, politicians could very easily mandate a solution to this problem if they actually wanted it solved and not be a hindrance for people that are in the public health sphere that are promoting this to smokers out there. Very simple solution. Charge a dollar for every product that's sold. And regardless of who returns it, they get the dollar back when they submit a product for return. When we were growing up as kids, you remember the pop bottles? You had to pay the, the price, 10 cents per bottle or five cents per bottle, whatever state you lived in. There were a couple states that did this. And you paid that when you bought the product. And when you brought the bottles back for recycling, you got the cash. And you don't have to have a receipt that you paid the, the taxes on it. The bottle said 10 cents for return. So if you took that in, they gave you 10 cents for bringing that bottle back. You do the same thing with all these and you could have a hundred percent recycle rate because even if the person that buys it and tosses it and bends it, you have people that are looking to make a little extra money. And if this was a dollar and you saw 50 of them laying on the road on your way to school every day, well, you just got a new part-time job, $50 a day, picking up the disposable you see on the streets. There wouldn't be any of them on the streets ever again. Simple solution, problem solved. Why has nobody thought of simple solutions? And just when you think big tobacco is doing the right thing, think again. Enjoy brings sweeping litigation against illicit disposable vape manufacturers. I've talked about this on the channel for a long time now. Since the PMTA deadline first came out, I said, number one, there's no way that the FDA is ever going to be able to read all these PMTA submissions. There are millions and millions and millions of submissions. It takes the average person so long to read a single page of paper. You do the math, you do multiply it out, how many millions of pages there were submitted and how long it would take the FDA to read it. They're not going to read every single thing. That's common sense. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand what's happening and what's going to happen next is right before our eyes. But you have to stay informed on what's going on around you. Enjoy bring sweeping litigation against the illicit disposable vapor market. They're a corporation. They have stockholders who rely on them to make a profit. So even if they want to be the good guy, which no longer anybody believes, they, they look at it and go... Well, if we got to look like a bad guy, let's really be the bad guy. Let's sue these people for selling products that didn't get FDA approval like we did for our product. There you go. There's your product. And by the way, FDA, the dumbest thing you ever did was say, look, we've authorized nine products. No, you didn't, you stupid assholes. There's only three products out there and a couple pods. That's it to replace 
the hundreds of thousands of products that people are actually using. So much misinformation out there. Anyway, link to that in the article. Because they're not the only place that's cracking down on this stuff. New York's react to Mayor Adams' latest move to enforce the flavored vape ban. For those of you that don't know, New York has banned all flavored vaping products, but you can still go to any shop and buy them. Who's gonna enforce the law? When they make a ridiculous law that, you know, people are going to flagrantly violate and do what they wanna do, who's gonna go into the stores, every single one of them across the whole state, and make sure that they're not actually selling this stuff? Who? Well, the mayor says, it's time to cut down on New York City's supply of flavored vapes. We're cutting it off for the source. We're going after the major distributors. They're not gonna be allowed to ship anything to retailers anymore in the five boroughs of New York City. An anti-vaping activist said that they are encouraged by the mayor's announcement on Monday. Why? Okay, so you, you chop it off from a legitimate distributor. So do you think it's gonna stop people from importing it in there? Because if you bother to look at the actual big picture, you come to realize tobacco taxes in New York are astronomical. A couple of years ago, we went to visit um, waterfalls, right? In Buffalo. It was like $15 a pack of cigarettes. Who the hell in their right mind is going to pay $15 for a pack of cigarettes? I mean, no, it's like Australia. The illicit black market supply for tobacco, you can go on any street corner and the guy opens his coat and says, what brand do you want? Newports, Marlboros, take your pick, Parliament, whatever you want. I got it, man. $10 a pack. What? $10 a pack? Well, yeah, I go to the Indian reservation and I go out here and then I sell this stuff to whoever wants it. I make a markup. Customers are happy. They don't have to pay, you know, $15 a pack of cigarettes. Everybody makes money. Except the mayor's not happy because, well, he's going to go and do this institution and he's going to wipe out a bunch of distributors. They're, you know, supplying product all across the country, not just in New York. But they're going to go after these distributors and shut them down, that's what their goal is. If we shut them down, problem solved, right? No, you moron. You're not gonna make the problem go away. You're gonna make the problem worse because now the chance of anybody on the street buying an adulterated product for somebody that just wants to make a quick buck and then disappear. It's like the war on drugs. How's the war on drugs going for you? Yeah? Not going good? Is it causing problems? Several medical emergencies at Prestonburg schools prompts investigation. Police say it was a mislabeled vaping product. Why are they lumping everything together? Please tell me, why are they lumping everything together? Store sold vapes to minors. Well, not everybody follows the law. Rocket scientists are gonna tell you that not everybody follows the law. The common man's gonna tell you not everybody follows the law. The police officer are gonna tell you that, the lawyers are gonna tell you that, everyone's gonna tell you that, but you still go and you create these ridiculous laws thinking, oh, the people are going to follow the law. We just gotta make a new law. That's like Australia. We, we banned all nicotine vaping products. You had to get a prescription to get the nicotine to bake your own stuff. It didn't work. 93% of the population said, forget it, man. We ain't following your stupid laws. We're going to get our stuff, and what are you going to do? You're not going to catch all of us. When you make a law that's so ridiculous, the majority of the people say, forget you. Your law is worthless. No, actually, it's not worthless. It's harming the public health because you know very well that it's nobody's going to follow it. It made you look good for five minutes. And if you're still in office next year, it's going to bite you in the ass. But nobody's holding the people accountable when it fails, when things are constantly failing left and right. 
and why every single law that they've passed just makes the situation worse. And by the way, you can guess that these were not nicotine vapes. The tobacco store was selling products of questionable origin to high school and junior high school students. They couldn't possibly know that they were purchasing because the products were completely mislabeled in violation of federal law. Okay? You want to know the truth? The products are illegal anyway because they never put them for PMTA. But the public is so misinformed by the brainwashed tobacco control people that, you know, this is what they do now. And the people that are on the front lines go, folks, we got two different products here, okay? We've got the THC products and we got the nicotine products. And, you know, if people are using this, don't worry about it. But we don't know what they're using because they can adulterate anything. And, well, it's still illegal for cannabis and it's definitely illegal for kids to have cannabis. So we need to hand out test kits so teachers, when they find these things on there, can swab it and go, is that nicotine? Is it blue? Is it THC? Is it pink? Is it purple? Is it green? I don't know what these test strips test for. But did you make the problem better? By banning it? Hmm? Or has the situation gotten worse? Some of them are drug related. Some are non-drug related. Well, no kidding. It's against the law for kids to have this stuff. But is it gonna stop the kids from getting this stuff? No, it's not. And it's not isolated to a single location around the country. Not one bit. Police investigate Kentucky smoke shop after miners overdose on mislabeled products. Is it Delta 8? Is it Delta 9? Is it Jimmy Bob's concoction that he mixed up in his little garage because he bought a bunch of stuff, little empty pods that he's now selling and packaging to whoever's going to buy his crap because he can sell it for a lot cheaper than if you had to pay the legitimate price for a legitimate product that has actually taxes on it and import fees and duties and state tobacco taxes and federal tobacco taxes. How is it hard for people to understand why the situation is the way it is? I mean, it's kind of obvious. You're going to have a black market. There's no way of doing around it. The only way to eliminate the black market is to minimize it. And the only way to minimize it is to have a legal, free, open market for safe, legitimate products and legitimate distributors. You crack down on the distributors, guess what's going to happen? Everybody's going to buy it on the black market. Just like cocaine and heroin and LSD and fentanyl and you name it, you want it, you can get it. Delivered right to your house. Sometimes by Uber, sometimes by the mailman, sometimes by your lake, local corner drug dealer. Jumps on his bike and makes a bunch of deliveries in town. Does it once a week, makes 20 grand a week. Want to get tougher on it? Double the fines. Price just went up. Now the guy's making 30 grand a week. Taking a bigger risk. More reward. Congratulations, you made the problem worse. How about you backtrack? Legalize, legitimize all these products. You wanna improve public health? You wanna improve the outcome? Or do you just want everybody to constantly be unhappy? Let's be realistic. Can we please? No, we're not. Schools are removing outer doors on bathrooms to crack down on students vaping. Can you guess where this is? Okay, it's obvious. You looked at the freaking URL link, right? This is the reason why I have the URL link, link, link up there. So that, you know, I don't have to put every single thing into YouTube because YouTube doesn't allow me to put hyperlinks to everything that's on there. So if I put it on the screen, you see it, it's linked. It's referenced. Ireland. Congratulations, i.e. The number of schools have removed the outer doors to bathrooms on their campuses in an effort to 
crack down on vaping as they struggle to find ways to deal with the large numbers of students using vapes during school hours. Oh, wow. Taking the bathroom doors is really going to stop people from vaping, isn't it? No, not at all. Is it going to make some people feel better? Maybe. Is it going to make privacy a thing of the past for this generation of kids? Definitely. How do most people feel about it? Right here. Frustrated. Everybody's mostly frustrated because we all know that this isn't going to work. Kids feel a little bit exposed. Is this a benefit to the public health? Let me ask you this. What would be so wrong with, I don't know, you've been doing it with smokers for decades. What would be wrong with creating I don't know, a smoke-free zone for vapors and a smoking butt hut that already exists for the tobacco smokers. And I don't know, letting kids go use them so that you know who's doing it, who has it. What is so wrong with that? Well, it's against the law. It's against the law. Well, then get rid of the stupid law. People are going to do what they want to do, and your laws don't stop anybody from doing anything. It's making the situation worse. An issue in every school. You see that? An issue in every school. Well, what happens if, I don't know, maybe somebody in their right mind has some common sense? Is there anybody that has some common sense? Well, apparently there are. This is the second story that I've seen this week. Why one school allows students to have smoking and vaping breaks. Police aim to reduce stress and disruptive behavior. Wait a minute. If you keep people honest and you let them do what they want to do because they're going to do it anyway. Even if you ban it, they're going to do it. So let's take it out of the closet, bring it out in the forefront and say, okay, anybody that wants to go and have a vape break, sign up here. We'll get you a hall pass. And certain times of the day, like when you go out in the real world and have a real job and you have to take smoke breaks or vape breaks, well, maybe college would be a better place if we started instituting the same things that they're going to have to do whenever they get into the real world, get a real job. So here's a unique opportunity and a unique thought. How about we let students of all ages at this special school in Queensland, allow them to have smoking and vaping breaks to reduce stress reduce disruptive behavior during class when they're just going to hide the fact. Mm, you caught me. Listen, if you tell them you're allowed to use this thing three times a day, and your lunch break. So four times a day, you're going to be allowed to go and take a break in between classes to go and do this. You got to be back in, in your next class on time. You got five minutes. That's all you get. Okay. 10 minutes. You get all you get. Whatever the, the, the allotted time is for teachers to go take a break and kids to go take a break. Imagine what happens if you say, okay, now if you do this in class, you're going to lose your privilege of going out there to do this which I think is ridiculous that it's a privilege, but we're so ba ass backwards in this world nowadays that this is the best thing that could possibly happen. Guess what's gonna happen? Disruptive behavior is gonna take a nosedive because they're not gonna be stressed out. They're gonna go out and they're gonna get their break and they're gonna come back and they, they're gonna be happy and they're gonna get back to work like we were when we were smokers. As many as 50 students are believed to be on the list and permitted to smoke or vape and even have their own designated areas. 
What a, what a, what a brilliant idea. And I guess when you look back at this thing, you're going to come to find out in a very short time how this transparent approach to smoking and vaping works. Okay? No judgment. Drop the judgment. Let's be honest with each other. And let the kids that are going to school focus on their education instead of trying to be criminals. All right. Enough harping. It's time for something different. I got a good one for you. You're going to love this one. Nicki Minaj freestyles over Drake and Chef Chief Keefe's All the Parties Listen. What? What on earth is this? And you got to love the alcohol advertising, smearing off ice. You're allowed to advertise that anywhere you want. But if you want to advertise a less harmful product than combustible cigarettes, not allowed anywhere. Sorry for your luck. But you want to advertise alcohol? Sure, go ahead. Internet, you're free reign to do whatever you want. Anyway, uh, I'm bringing this one up because I want you to take a look at these lyrics for this, okay? These bitches don't want beef, sheaf, hold the steak. These bitches don't want to smoke, say no to vape. I get these bitches scrambling when I throw the bait. Listen, I'm not a rapper. But here you got Nicki Minaj telling people in her song, no smoking, no vaping. Does Nicki Minaj smoke weed? Is she a hypocrite? Or is she trying to do some public good, some public service by telling people, don't smoke, don't vape? If you don't smoke and don't vape, don't start. If you do, good luck trying to get a nice, legal, safe supply of it. Because even though you have it now, don't take it for granted. Very near future, Politicians may take that away from you for five minutes of fame to look good that we're cracking down on drugs. We're cracking down on smoking. We're going to fix this problem. Yeah, right. Here's another wild one for you. Woman jumps railing to vape while dangling legs over the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. Oh, my goodness. You're not allowed to jump the rail. People don't give a shit about the laws anymore. Did we not cover enough news articles showing you that people flagrantly violate whatever rules there are if they think it's a ridiculous rule? Yeah, well, the Cal Seat Springs Overlook treats visitors to awe inspiring panoramas of the Grand Canyon and Yellowstone River, and this location is a magnet for photographers seeking that perfect shot. However, this week, the perfect shot was a picture of her dangling her legs over the edge on the precipice so she could sit down, relax, take a break. Maybe she thought that was the designated vaping area in the park. Oh, we're out. Unreal, man. People are going to do reckless things. People have a natural tendency to be wild and free. And just because you put up a sign that says you're not supposed to do that, is not going to actually stop people that want to do that from doing that. Perfect example. Communities can't recycle or trash e-cigarettes, so what happens to them? It's a legitimate question. We've got all these wonderful disposable products that are helping smokers quit and helping people from going back to cigarette smoking, but what are you supposed to do with them? Quite honestly, I take mine apart. I haven't had a chance to do that recently because, well, I've got too many other things going on. But you can take these things apart and you can sit there and wash out the, the sponges that are in here and the, you know, the cotton material and the wicking material that's in here. You can wash it out, dilute it, let it run down the drain. It's not going to hurt anything in the environment. On the, on the scale that you have cigarette butts littering the entire environment, this is nothing. The waste treatment plants are going to dilute it and wash it out and 
I don't even tell you about the pharmaceutical products that we pee out that are, are in the water supply. That's a whole nother conversation. This is a legitimate problem. And I already told you guys earlier how simple the solution is to it. Charge a dollar for every one of these products and whoever returns it gets a dollar for bringing it into the shop. You won't have any of these things any, anywhere. And believe me, the, the cost conscious consumer is going to be returning these things when they go buy their replacements. Here we go, more progress. We talked about how Altria is going and banning all the disposable products that are out there. And I'm sick and tired of this. Everybody wants you to sign up to their website. Do you really think that you're gonna get people to sign up? No, you're not. And the fact that you keep popping these things up here makes me want to use a different browser that doesn't allow you to pop, force these pop-ups in my face. Sorry, you're here for you know a podcast and news, not some raging lunatic crying the blues about something else that the government screwed up when they could require these laws be the way they are. People are just trying to make a buck, trying to survive. Well, Philip Morris submits applications to commercialized heated tobacco device ICOS to the United States. Funny how this product was already authorized for sale in the United States, but because of a patent war, now they gotta submit it again. Because the ridiculous regulations in the United States by the FDA require you, if you make any changes whatsoever, including the packaging, you have to resubmit your product for authorization. What a ridiculous process. Why can't it be like it is in the European Union where you just, okay, here's a database. You wanna sell something? Fill out this paperwork. It tells you what you use as your ingredients in there. And, you know, there's a database of information. These are the list of things you can include in your product. List all the things that you do have in your product. And uh, your contact information. If something turns out to be wrong with your stuff, we know how to come after you and find you. And go sell it. No, not in the United States. In the United States, you got to deal with the bureaucracy and the federal government and the FDA and all their changing regulations and constantly updated mandates. And if you decide to change the packaging because you ran out of red dye number 65 and, and um, red dye number two is half the cost and you want to switch the colors, well, you're going to have to submit a PMTA and revise your application and hope that they authorize it again. But it's about a five-year backlog, so... I hope you have five years worth of ink in case, you know, the manufacturer quits making it and you can no longer manufacture your thing or you just change it in the background and don't tell the FDA that, well, it looks like the same color. So seriously, here we have a product that's less harmful than combustible cigarettes. So it's, on, it's for sale in the rest of the world in different areas of the world. In Japan, they have heat not burn. It's a big thing. Combustible cigarette sales are plummeting. Heat not to burn is taking over. They don't even have the whole vaping situation. But their people are healthier because they're using a less harmful product. But here in the United States, it's going to be probably five years before you see ICOs for sale here. Because they have to put in another PMTA and hope that the FDA actually authorizes it. No. It's not grandfathered, so guess what? Grateful Dead partners with Granko Science to launch new G Pen Dash Vaporizer. No, I'm not signing up to your website. Stop bugging me. I'll never visit your website again. The only reason I'm here is because you had one decent article. Seriously? Eager to learn about the ultimate vape for deadheads? Read on our more about the one and only Grateful Dead XG Pen Dash Vaporizer. Uh oh, does that look like Google? Huh? Does that look like Google's logo? Or are they gonna go into a patent lawsuit? Probably not. I'm getting a little ridiculous here. This is a dry herb vaporizer, and no, it's not traditional vaping, but this is a reality, folks. 
Just like you saw in the news intro in the bumper, they're legalizing weed and cannabis. You're gonna be able to walk into your local smoke shop, which are now head shops. You're gonna be able to buy yourself blueberry flavored cannabis. You can smoke or vape, but in a short matter of time, you're not gonna be able to buy any delicious cinnamon Danish swirl muffins that have nicotine in it. It's got cannabis, perfectly fine. But if you don't wanna smoke cigarettes, and you don't wanna smoke pot, Sorry for your luck, you're gonna have to DIY yourself. Not hard. Stop by on the Mixing and Chilling vlog every Tuesday at noon. We'll show you a bunch of great recipes. All right, moving on. We do have some information here, and this is why we brought up the whole cannabis situation at all. Because quite honestly, CBD is legal, right? You can go in and get CBD. So what is the safe and healthy allowable limit for cannabis. Fortunately, this conversation is coming up in the news. Since 2018, when the UK Parliament passed legislation legalizing CBD, the non-psychoactive component of cannabis, sales of CBD-related products have skyrocketed. They're all over the place. Today, you can buy CBD oil, CBD vape pens, CBD coffee, CBD muffins, to go with your CBD coffee and CBD everything. And these products are often sold with various vague promises of increased health and wellness. And if you look at the science, you'll come to find out, yes, CBD oil does help. I've got some I use it on my back, but it works better if it actually has just a little bit of THC in there because see, microbiology is a funny thing. Things are paired up in nature and when you mess with it and just extract one thing, well, you're going to have side effects that are counteracted by the other thing because things in nature balance themselves out. However, in the UK, to be clear, 10 milligrams is the advisable safe limit. You won't be arrested if you consume more than 10 milligrams, but the agency wants to warn you that there may be long-term health effects if you ignore the advice of 10 milligrams per day limit for CBD consumption. Namely, your liver and your thyroid do not like when they get too much of it. There's only so much that your body can metabolize on its own. So, there's also a bunch of other things that are, you know, information you guys need to know about with CBD and schizophrenia and anxiety. And if you have too much of it, it's gonna cause these things. You might have your first outbreak of schizophrenia or anxiety because you consumed too concentrated a dosage of THC or CBD or the stuff that's out there. Instead of focusing on eliminating the single best way to quit smoking, maybe we should be focusing on doing the science to get caught up and find out what are the safe dosages for people to consume. And at what concentration is it too concentrated for people to consume it at that dosage. People right now are selling it to sell it. There's no legislation or no regulations in place. And there's very little science to tell you, well, if you have 15 milligrams every single day, in 20 years, you're going to have some liver or thyroid damage. I don't know that. And well, for the people that do use it, they want a hands-off approach because anytime the government gets involved, they tend to screw it up more than they fix anything. Anyway, I came across this and I thought I'd convey this information out to you, let you know that 10 milligrams of CBD is the daily limit you should try to observe. And obviously the dosage is relevant based upon how it's applied. Obviously when you're vaping at 10 milligrams is completely different than 10 milligrams applied to your skin. It's not about what you put on your skin, it's what's actually absorbed into your body. That's where the 10 milligram comes from. No, I don't know if a thousand milligrams put on your skin is gonna to translate to 10 milligrams in your blood. I have no clue. And you'd be hard pressed to find people that actually do know that kind of information because it's been a banned topic for our entire life. So let's focus on some, oh, I don't know, other science. From Ricardo Pelosa, we have ourselves the most widespread flavor 
at the time of quitting traditional cigarettes is once again confirmed to be fruit flavors, followed by dessert and sweets. These flavors were also considered the most helpful for people who wanted to quit smoking. And here's the link for you today from the Harm Reduction Journal. We have the patterns of flavored e-cigarette use among adult vapors in the United States. An online cross-sectional survey of 69,233 participants, authored and chaired by Constantinos Farsalinos. He's our most revered vape researcher out there. Did long time ago the study about metals and they were saying there was metals in your vape and metals leaching from your, your coils if you dry burn them. He did the actual science that can be reproduced and has done numerous scientific studies out there. And he's also trying to create a standard for other scientists to follow when you're producing science for it to be reproducible you got to stay within the constraints of what an actual vaping device is. Nobody in their right mind is going to vape this if this device was set to 500 watts. But you could do it on a lab equipment when you're testing things. And you're going to show that it's more harmful for you than cigarette combustion. But we know it's a lie because nobody's ever going to use this thing at 500 watts. It's not capable of doing it for more than one toke. The battery size limitations, the, the, there's so many things that make it an unreproducible scientific study when they try and do these crazy things. And once again, here we have wonderful study from Constantinos Farsalinos and Ricardo Pelosa, Christopher Russell, and et al. Published in a harm reduction journal. All right, that masters that for your uh, edification. We also have some more science here about um, nicotine use and Parkinson's. Another study finds that smokers are less likely to get Parkinson's. Yeah. And it's not just smokers, it's also drinkers. It's the study I'm thinking of that I read earlier this week. There we go. There have been no studies on the association between changes in smoking and alcohol consumption or combined changes in smoking and alcohol consumption frequencies and Parkinson's disease to assess the influence of changes in smoking and alcohol consumption on the risk of Parkinson's disease. And conclusion, smoking is associated with decreased risk of Parkinson's with a dose response relationship, meaning the higher the dose, you get the more likely um, decrease in risk from Parkinson's. Alcohol consumption at light levels is also associated with a decreased risk of Parkinson's. And if you do both, you get the same positive protective effects. So once again, drink up, enjoy your vape. And you're gonna have less Parkinson's, kind of like what Dr. Charles Gardner said on the last episode of the Mixing and Chillin' vlog. We, we talked about and showed that from the, um, I don't know, the New Nicotine Alliance. I can't think off the top of my head, but he used to give an interview and he said, what would happen if, a thought, here's a little thought for you, okay? A thought experiment. What happens if everybody on the planet was required to wear a nicotine patch? Well, all the health benefits of using nicotine on a regular basis would be obvious in the data. Less Parkinson's, ulcerative colitis, ADHD, attention deficit disorder, dementia, Alzheimer's. There's a whole list of things that are beneficial effects of nicotine consumption on a regular basis. It's nice to have some science verifying one, something that we already know. And this is something that's been repeated because I do remember seeing a study from back in 2014 that said the exact same thing. That's the thing about science. It's reproducible. All right. So let's time for some bad news again. We had some wonderful inspirational science for us. How about we have the Guardian throwing out their things, every single website. Okay, now here comes an advertisement for you. Anyway, sorry. Croydon convenience store worker fined 1,100 pounds for selling vapes to teens. 
A worker at the convenience store in Croydon has been fined 1,100 pounds after he sold a vape to a teen. Here's the guy's name. Pras, Prasenth Kurup, 37, was found guilty of the offense at Croydon Magistrates Court on October 9th. The court heard he was working at PNN Convenience Store in Bensham Lane in Thornton Heath on February 15th when he sold a disposable vape to somebody under the age of 18. This stuff goes on here in the United States. And the fact that he's got to pay 1,100 pound and a $440 surcharge is going to make him think twice before doing this again. Unlike here in the States, when you get, um, you know, the FDA going around and visiting convenience stores and gas stations and they're um, sending their little underage people in there to verify that they're checking ages of sale when they sell tobacco products of any kind. And uh, when they get busted, their name gets maybe put in a local newspaper if the newspaper is following it. And the fines are minuscule. So what are you actually cracking down on? Maybe if the fines were significant, these stores would not sell it to underage people. But simply shutting the store down isn't going to work because Kenny talked about that. You know, he's got a store down the street that got shut down by um, trading standards over there. And you know what the guy did? He kept his store locked. It was shut down. But that didn't stop him from selling in his car right in front of the store that was closed. So when his customers came there and said, hey, man, you're closed. He's like, yeah, trading standards shut me down. But if you want some smokes, I got, I got them right here in the trunk. They're the same ones I was selling in the store that I got busted for. <sighs> you're not going to get a black market. And if you make the regu regulations too restrictive, guess what? People are going to buy it on the black market and your public health Sin taxes are actually driving the problem into a place where it's worse than if you simply accepted the fact that these things are going to be for sale elsewhere. And now we got another one. Dudley shop closed for illegal sales. You wonder why I was talking about, you know, closing it is not a good thing. Well, there you go. Black market tobacco products, cigarettes. They were untaxed, brought in from probably another country or who knows where. But this Dudley shop has been ordered to close after found selling illegal cigarettes and vapes to the public. Make the regulations reasonable so the consumers can buy what it wants. You have a free market. You will have people jumping and chomping at the bit to remain compliant but you gotta keep everything reasonable. All right, next. I've got so much to cover today. I'm sorry this is going long. I know this is gonna be a two hour report, but when it's been so long since I've done it, I come across too many things and this isn't just telling you the news. I'm actually telling you some background bits so that you can understand what's going on. It's gonna be however long it's gonna be. It's a podcast, not a 10-minute news report. Bridgeport Litter pick uncovers more vapes than ever. This is a real problem. And we talked about how simple the solution could be. Imagine if these people that were doing this litter pickup crew duty got a dollar for every single one of the vapes that they collected. You better believe that they would be separated from the rest of the trash that they collected and it would buy them all a nice lunch after they get done doing their cleanup crew. Adopt the highway program and would give it a whole new surge of people willing to do it if they could, you know, make a buck while they're collecting all this stuff. Here we go. Another, another article. 1,400 illegal vapes were seized in West Sussex. No, I don't want to sign up for your stuff. <sighs> Over 1,400 legal vapes seized as West Sussex Council cracks down on illicit sales. Maybe the reason why you've got such a large number of illicit sales is because, well, 
The rest of the world is accustomed to buying 50 milligram nicotine content in their vapes. And the vapes are a lot smaller and the amount of vapor that they actually consume and inhale into their lungs is much less on a product than one that is capped at 20 milligrams or let's say 10 milligrams. Clearly seen. But this is the kind of product I would need. There's obviously people out there that don't want that and they want this because this works for them. Time to drop the nicotine cap. Let everybody around the world sell it at 50 milligrams. You want a legal regulated market that all shops abide by? Have reasonable regulations that doesn't give the black market sellers an advantage over the legitimate law abiding shops. More common sense, heaven forbid. Now we're gonna jump over to New Zealand cause you're gonna love this one. All right. They have a massive problem with vaping, right? They limited the sales to specialist vape shops. If you want a flavor in New Zealand, you have to go to a specialist vape shops because gas stations, corner stores, and dairies are only allowed to sell tobacco, mint, and menthol. So guess what's going to happen when you've got an underage consumer that wants a creme brulee or a cinnamon roll or some fairy floss? Well, they're going to go to a vape shop. And because they know the vape shops are going to restrict the sales to those of age, well, guess what's going to happen? The teenagers are going to be inspired to do either a ram raid or they're just going to do a blatant robbery of the store because guess what? The teens want it. And teens are going to get what they want. They got nothing else to do with their time. So what happens? Well, three teenagers allegedly assaulted a woman in a South Dunedin vape shop after being denied their evening nicotine fix. Senior Sergeant Anthony Bond of Dunedin said police were called to Hillsdale Road at 8.15 p.m. after the 20-year-old woman reported being assaulted by three teenagers. The trio attempted to enter the vape store called Vapor Z, but were denied service as they are under age. The three took exception to this and then allegedly assaulted the woman before fleeing the scene in a car. Well, something's got to be done. Are we actually doing a service to the community by restricting access? Or perhaps should we have some reasonable regulations that say, you know what, if you're underage and you get a parent to sign off on it, we're going to allow you to have it so long as you don't get carried away and you aren't doing it to try and get high. If you've been surrounded your entire life by cigarette smokers, guess what you're going to end up doing? Why is it so hard for tobacco control to understand this? You cannot solve the teen problem by prohibiting it. Prohibition doesn't work. You need to get their parents to go, hey, man. I need to quit these cigarettes. Let me try these instead. And then you get a generation of kids that go, mom and dad don't smoke anymore, but they vape. And well, I don't want to be a dishonest kid and steal my parents' vapes. So how about my parents sign off and let me go to the store and get a job to work, to earn the money, so I can go out and buy this with mom and dad's approval. What would happen? Well, maybe there'll be a whole generation of kids that don't have Parkinson's and ulcerative colitis and dementia and Alzheimer's. Who knows what can happen? No, we've got these ridiculous prohibitionists out there that want to disregard the science and it's for their own good because, well, we've been in tobacco control for 30 years and guess what? We've been a hammer our entire life pounding on tobacco control and guess what? Now everything looks like a nail. And we're just going to pound away at it. We don't care that it's actually doing the opposite effect. Common sense. What happened to common sense in this world? 
because once again, disposable vape problem. This isn't going to go away until we do something about it, people. Non-recyclable and hazardous rate, hazardous waste reaches 12 million per month. People are buying this because they don't want to buy combustible cigarettes. You want to eliminate cigarette butts on the ground? Get people to switch to vapes. You want to eliminate vaping, disposable, and single-use products from being littered? Recycle them. Charge a dollar per product and have that dollar be returned to whoever returns the empty used container. Then have that in the same supply chain that are delivering these products to the shops, return them to the manufacturers, and let it be their responsibility to dispose of these products appropriately. And not just dispose of them, but reuse them, because lithium is a limited quantity. It's like oil. There's only so much of it on the planet. Why not reuse and recycle them? So what happens with Tesla batteries when they go bad? They get reused and recycled and re regenerated and they find their ways into power tools. And then once they live their life in that cycle, then they go to something that requires less dense energy and it gets reused. It's common sense. <sighs> All right. I've been wound up. I'm sorry, folks. But I've got one for you that is the most infuriating article this week. Why is it the most infuriating article? Because when you have a population that is completely misinformed about the potential risks and harms and benefits of these products, and they bought all the bullshit propaganda from tobacco control, hook, line, and sinker, then you end up with an article that's like this. One that is... The author, I'm sure, tried to do their best. But you know what? There's so much misinformation out there. They don't know their ass from a f***ing hole in the ground. And it's the FDA's fault for putting the information out there. And it's the CDC's fault for putting the information out there. And it's Dr. Brian King's fault for directing the CDC and the FDA to push this propaganda misinformation out there and not correct it when they see the public gets it wrong. Vape shops proliferate near FAU's Boca Raton campus as popularity of e-cigarettes grows. Listen, moron. The reason they're popular is because they work. And they're not going to kill you. The challenge for stores isn't the CDC's warning about vaping. It's keeping an ever-changing line of products to hook customers into coming back. It's not about hooking customers. It's about what happens when you have a marketplace that relies on consumer satisfaction. If you go and you buy a car and well, the brakes are always squeaking on it and the transmission's always slipping and sometimes it starts and sometimes it doesn't start, guess what? That dealership's gonna go out of business real quick if that's the only car they sell. So guess what? They need to sell a car that's reliable and uses what and gives the consumer what they want when they go to purchase something. It's the same thing with vape shops. It's not about trying to hook more people. It's the biggest load of horse shit in the world. Boca Raton. Underneath the blue skies of Boca Raton, clouds of smoke are being blown more than ever. That's a good thing because they're not lighting tobacco on fire and breathing in the over 7,000 carcinogens inside of a cigarette. You should be celebrating the fact that these people are going to a vape shop and buying a product that is 95, 98, 99% less harmful than smoking. You want to solve disease and death in this country? How about putting a safe supply where people want to consume nicotine, can buy a product that is safe and effective for them to not consume it using a cigarette? No, we're not going to do that. We're going to buy them the CDC and the FDA's misinformation campaign. The long-term effects of vaping are still hard to discern because, well, vaping has only raised concerns in the past decade. Okay, but you can do scientific studies and you can take a look at that and compare that to what happens when you expose a cell or anything to regular cigarette smoke. And then what happens when you expose a cell to vapor? from a vape that is not combusted. 
and you realize, oh, it's much less. Well, what about the constituents inside the vapor? Let's take a look at them and put them under a mass spectrometer and take a look at it and break it down, find out what chemicals and substances are actually inside this vapor. Well, first off, there aren't as many of them in there. There's a couple that aren't inside of a cigarette, but at concentrations that are far below anything that OSHA has ever put any restrictions on. So, well, if OSHA is okay with you breathing that stuff in, if it didn't come from this particular device or this particular device or this device or vaping technology as a whole, why is it gonna be a problem down the road? And why are we letting millions of people die every single year? Eight million people, it's not up to 8.1 million people a year around this planet because of cigarette smoking we have a product that won't kill them. Anyway. Folks, coming an hour, 47 minutes of this recording so far today. I've got so much other information to tell you about. And there's so many other articles I could have covered today. But... Quite honestly, I think you get the message. You get the fact that there's so much information out there. We're inundated with so much misinformation. And the people that are actually writing these articles are contributing to the misinformation because there is no single source of reliable information to be had. Let's, let's go to Google for just one second. All right. I want to know what is the number of smokers globally? How many smokers are there on the planet? Okay, here we go. We're up to 1.1 billion. Hold on, is that, is that the most accurate up to date? One in every 10 cigarettes, blah, 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 blah. Wait a minute. According to the World Health Organization, around 80% of the 1.3 billion tobacco users live in lower and middle income countries. So what is it? Is it 1.3 billion? Or is it 1.1 billion? Come on now, Vital Strategies and World, to World Health Organization and Bloomberg and all these tobacco control freaks all work together, right? So, what's the actual number? Report, global tobacco users are 1.3 billion. With 1.1 billion smokers in the world and 200 million more who use tobacco products, tobacco remains a global epidemic. No, it is not an epidemic. An epidemic is something that you cannot possibly have fathomed was going to happen. Are you a moron? What definition of epidemic allows you to say that tobacco use is an epidemic? It's not an epidemic. It's been going on since the Indians still ruled the land of America. They smoke tobacco. This is not an epidemic. This is prolonged use of a product that is harmful to people. And if that's what people want, that's what people are going to use. Unless you give them something that tastes better, is less of a pain to use, and they enjoy more, well, then tobacco's naturally going to go extinct the way of the square wheel or the wagon and horse and buggy. I mean, let's use technology to improve society and not solely for profit. But the whole point of this conversation was, is okay, great. 1.3 billion, tobacco control has done a complete failure. When I got started, it was less than a billion. Then it was 1.1. Somehow we missed 1.2 and now we're at 1.3 billion. And yes, I understand that the world population is growing. There's no question about that. Where is it? There you go. This is what the projected growth is of the population on the planet. Currently 8.1 billion people. 
Well, I think tobacco control is an utter failure. If we go from 1 billion to 1.1 to now 1.3, what's it going to be when it hits 9 billion? We're going to have 2 million? Huh? 2 billion smokers? Or perhaps, perhaps we can take, I don't know, a pragmatic approach and recognize the fact that, well, if we give people a safer, less harmful option that is better, more enjoyable and cheaper for them to buy, that um, tobacco consumption and tobacco combustion is going to become extinct. Problem solved. How about I want to know the number, the percentage of smokers globally by country. Is there anybody on the face of the earth that has put together this list? Let's take a look at this one. Oh my goodness, we have 105 rows. Well, we have 105 rows, we're obviously missing some. We talked about in the beginning of the thing, how many countries we are around the globe, how many recognized countries we have, right? There's only 105 listed. Well, how come we don't have any information from these countries? Huh? You would think that tobacco control would bother to did find out what the actual percentage of people is smoking around the world. How are you going to go around and tell me that your tobacco control policies are actually improving society if you cannot track over time tobacco consumption? And if you cannot separate out vaping and less harmful alternative consumption of nicotine versus the most deadly, most documented form of mass suicide on the planet. You want to talk about, you know, an epidemic. It's not an epidemic. Well, then call it a mass suicide. Because people know the damages and they know the dangers of it. As a smoker, I knew exactly what the damage and dangers were of combustion. But no, you're not going to focus on that, are you? You're going to focus on making it more and more and more ridiculous. But you're not going to give me a list of countries. Here you have the United States that says, the, the, the total smoking rate is 25.1%. Well, I know that's bullshit. It's not, that, it's not 25% and it hasn't been for decades. How about New Zealand? Because off the top of my head, I know the rate of smoking or smokers in New Zealand. And here you say it's 14.8%. This date is way out of, this is no longer accurate. Here's some interesting information for you, okay? Look at the size of China and look at the size of the United States, right? The land mass in the United States is actually more than it is in China. But the population density in China is far greater than it is in the United States. Would you be surprised to find out that China has more cigarette smokers in this country of China than the entire population of the United States? You would think that that is unfathomable. Because if you know anything about the United States, you know that the population in the United States is about 330 million and growing. And the population of China is astronomical. Let's take a look at this and do some math. Because you're not going to believe me until I show you. Population of China is 1.4 billion in 2021. All right? So... Let's do some math. Let's pull out the old calculator. 1 billion, 412 million, thousand, right? 1 billion, 412 million, this is 100,000, right? Times, what was it, point? 256, 25.6%, 361,472,000 cigarette smokers in China. Why isn't China adopting tobacco harm reduction? They've been manufacturing these products since its existence. Why? Is it truly for profit for China tobacco? Is it truly about the income to the country? 
when it could very easily manufacture a much safer and healthier product for their population? Is it population control? Why they haven't instituted tobacco harm reduction in China? Why they banned so many ingredients and there's only a certain list of ingredients that they can use to manufacture products in China? What's the deal? Of all the countries in the world, you would think that they would have the most vested interest in tobacco harm reduction. But where are they? They sell their products to the rest of the world. They sell their products to their own consumers as long as it's tobacco flavor. Which is stupid. What makes vaping the most successful quit aid on the planet is all the flavors. Because no two people on the planet like the same damn thing. Everybody likes something just a little bit different. Some people love grapes. Some people are repulsed by it. Some people love watermelon. Some people are repulsed by it. You have to have the mass selection of flavors for it to work. 360,472,000 smokers in China. Population of the United States, 331,900,000. There you go, there's a little bit of fact for you. And something for you to think about this week. Cause I'm gonna plan on putting this out every single week. What would it take for China to institute the same measures as the UK? What would it take for China to give every single one of their cigarette smokers the incentive to use vaping instead of smoking? Think about that. Leave it in the description below as a comment. I'd really love to know. I wanna have a conversation about this. I want to advance this because if there's any way for us to solve the problem of this smoking and tobacco epidemic on the planet, we need to have a conversation, a logical, factual-based conversation about what haven't we tried yet? I'm certain that, that China hasn't tried the same approach because the UK is the first one on the planet to actually hand smokers a less harmful way to, for them to continue consumption of the thing that drives them to die an early death. It's really that simple. When you boil down the facts, and by the way, we should go without saying, there is no country on the entire planet that has completely banned cigarette smoking. If it's such a large problem, why hasn't a single country succeeded in solving this problem? Are they too reliant on the tobacco taxes? Are they using it as a form of population control so they don't have to pay social security when people reach age? Well, what's the reason? What logical reason would there be to not solve a simple, simple problem? And no, I don't ever expect cigarette smoking to be completely eliminated off the face of the earth because there are people that do it for religious purposes. You're not gonna convince them to switch to a less harmful product because it violates their religious and moral stance on the situation. But the rest of the world that doesn't have that restriction would gladly switch to a product if it was easy to use. They didn't have to worry about batteries and voltages and mods. It wasn't an environmental impact concern because as a single use product, you paid a dollar extra for it. And if you take this back to the store when you get the new one, well, this is gonna get recycled. Imagine that. We actually improve the planet, improve people's health, and institute a pragmatic solution to a problem that affects every single country around the planet. So one last thing. I know I'm hitting the two hour mark, but one last thing. I wanna know why the percentage of smokers globally is not listed somewhere. Tobacco control is such a, a, a prime example of, you know, this is what we got to do to solve the problem. Well, how about you show me a list of the country where the problems are the worst? That's number one. And number two, my next question is how come 
your list doesn't correspond with the changes that you say happen when you increase tobacco taxes and you ban outdoor smoking and all these prescription and vaccine things that Dr. Brian King wrote in his article is the necessary vaccine for tobacco combustion. Show me a list to show that over time, the countries that have adopted your framework, which by the way, I do have, and I have read, World Health Organization calls the global tobacco situation an epidemic. I already told you how wrong that is. And they, they come up with this lovely document here. It's 212 pages long, right? And they want to empower people around the planet. Show me the data that shows that if people adopt this, it actually gets better. No, you haven't even created a f***ing list of where cigarette smoking is the highest and what country is the lowest and kept it up to date. But you do have a problem with the single best way to quit smoking. They're addictive and not without harm. Mother focus on the people that are dying, not the, oh, we can save these other new generations because your solution hasn't worked in the entire life that I've been in existence. You want to change things? You want to make things better? Start here, not the bull that you're doing here. Because I have yet to be convinced that your tobacco control tactics do anything but make the problem worse. And there are more people dying now than were when I was a child. And if your things are so fantastic, why are you wasting money on this bull conference that isn't working? You know how many lives you could be saved? instead of trying to pass these new registration laws that make things ridiculous and make the black market grow, and then you gotta spend money on the black market police to try and capture these things. What happens if you took this $9,276,787 and you went out and handed 927,688 vapes to smokers out there. I guarantee you the number of people that are smoking next year might actually be less than they were this year. But you won't try it because all you give a shit about is pushing the same old, same old with the same old, same old results. So that wraps up this news. Signs, advocacy, and podcast. Because without facing hypocrisy, we will never reach a better tomorrow if we don't set our goals high and work using common sense and factual knowledge. We'll never make the world a better place. You can try. You can make your world a better place. But for that world improvement to translate needs to be done by everybody, not just you. So my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. I hope you guys have a fantastic week and I'll catch you on the podcast next week. Take care. Have a great day.